Now we're moving into the topic of community ecology. We'll look at plant communities. In plant ecology, there are several important terms to learn and how they relate to one another. A community, just like in regular ecology, is a group of populations that live together in the same place. An association is a particular type of community that is the same, more or less, wherever you find it. Uniform physiognomy means it looks the same. Consistent floristic composition means more or less the same species are found there, give or take a few. And it's always found in a particular habitat. And last of all, the word stand is used to represent a single example of a community. Basically, why certain plants live where they do is the result of a combination of effects. The place itself, geography, what's present in that site, resources, shade, light, water, etc. And also, there are effects of from where the plant evolved or its phylogeny. So in any one place, or, or I should say all over the world, there are a bunch of different taxa or species. And guilds are species that are similar, that do similar things, not necessarily taxonomically related. Communities occur all over the world, and where these three things intersect, ensembles, this is kind of like associations in the previous list of terms. Some of the earliest thinking about communities and community ecology came from plant ecologists, and some of the early ecologists looked at a plant community almost like an organism itself, an integrated unit with each of the species as kind of like one of the organs or tissues of the organism. It was first Frederick Clements in the 1920s who talked, equated plant associations with organisms. And this kind of built up even higher with Thomas Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis that views the whole world as a living organism. Jared Diamond proposed assembly rules for communities, applying them to animals and plants. And Dick Root, also in the late 70s, was the one to coin the term guild for species unrelated, but that do a similar job. They don't even have to look like each other. They just do similar things. Another view of plant ecology was that uh, first described by Gleason and later elaborated by Gleason and Cronquist, who wrote a book about the individualistic concept of the plant association. This is a sort of continuum view that there are slight differences between one site to another, and this is determined by dispersal and the environment and the experience of each individual species. So. Every community is sort of a lucky or fortuitous combination of things that ended up there. Also, their view was that plants live wherever they can disperse to and are tolerated, and the distribution patterns for each species can vary individually rather than for the community as a whole. The modern synthesis in plant ecology encompasses both of the classical approaches with some new ideas thrown in. Tillman's competition ideas, which you've learned about in ecology, and he's done a lot of work with plant communities as well. Pickett and Shugart, the importance of disturbance in determining what species are present in a community. The British 
plant ecologist John Harper and Jonathan Silvertown made many contributions of the importance of individual species population dynamics in shaping communities. And Phil Regal um, uh, made evident the importance of plant-animal interactions, especially why angiosperms became so dominant over gymnosperms due to mutualistic interactions with pollinators and seed dispersers. And other scientists made us aware of the presence of certain species much more influential than their numbers would suggest. These are keystone species. So I want to go over some of the important attributes of plant communities. And we'll look at these different aspects of how a community looks or its physiognomy, architecture, life forms, cover, and phenology. Let's look at architecture first. It was customary in early plant ecology to use profile diagrams to depict what the forest composition was like, and this was perhaps accomplished in many places by cutting down all the trees and measuring them. So uh, any forest has different strata, A at the top, B lower, and C lower still, where A are trees that emerge out of the top of the canopy, B is, are the canopy trees, C the subcanopy trees, D the shrubs, woody plants closer to the ground, and E, the ground layer, which is herbaceous plants and also the younger versions of shrubs and trees. So here's a profile diagram of a typical tropical rainforest, this one in Trinidad. We don't see any emergent trees here, just canopy trees, so I guess that would be the B layer. And below that, so here's the canopy. Below that, that is the subcanopy, trees with their canopies below the top canopy, and then lower still the shrub layer here. The herbaceous flora on the ground isn't shown in this diagram. But what I want you to notice is the how the, the whole profile is sort of filled in with different canopies of trees at different heights. You can contrast this with a temperate woodland, this one here by Pierre Dansero, and you can see canopy, subcanopy, but there's quite a bit of distance here, open understory, and then some shrubs and some herbs. And I like this diagram very much because they've used little pictures in the canopies to show what kind of trees are present with different leaf shapes, needle-like leaves to symbolize gymnosperms, broad leaves, typical um, flowering plant trees, and then grasses have different symbols like in the understory. And over here, they describe the type of leaves that the trees have also by the shade of green. So this, there's a lot of information in this particular profile diagram. Another important attribute is cover over the ground or leaf area index. And this is a measure of total leaf area over a particular unit of ground area. So you include leaves at all the different layers. And you can see that for this corn plant, much shorter, there's a lot less, fewer leaves, maybe four or five over one little spot of ground, versus a big tall tree, which has many, many layers of leaves. And a pine tree, or gymnosperm, has many, well, lots of skinny leaves with lots of space for light to go through. So if we look at the same the leaf area index of gymnosperms, pine trees would be much less. And then there's phenology. We talked about this a little before. 
people determined phenology for plants in a community by marking individuals and monitoring them throughout the months of the year and noting things of interest like new leaves produced, leaves falling off, buds and flowers present, and fruit, immature and mature fruit. And by collecting these data for all of the trees or all of the plants of a different you know, group, in a community throughout the year, you can see if there are correlations with climate. And for most species in most forests, there's a characteristic time of year that they flower or fruit. Some tropical trees don't flower every year. Some have supra-annual patterns. Maybe they flower every five or seven or eight years. And in this case, they may be massed fruiting, which we talked about a little before. Phenology has become important lately in helping us realize that the climate is changing. In the northeast part of the U.S., Henry David Thoreau made collections and observations of plants hundreds of years ago, and Botanists have noticed recently by monitoring, comparing collections made hundreds of years ago with those made today that the time of bloom has become earlier and earlier. So of course the most important components of a community are the species that are present. Composition of a community has some species that are characteristic of a community always found in that community. Some that are accidental there sometimes if they happen to be dispersed there. And ubiquitous species which are those found everywhere in many different kinds of communities. You can look at these different species and measure their relative importance to give some basis of comparison among them and between communities. Species can occupy different patterns in a community, maybe distribution characteristic of certain micro habitats. They may be more obvious at some times than at other times. Maybe they die back and are underground and not obvious at certain times of the year. And in different places, or Different species in the same community can have different niche breaths. They may occupy a wider range of microenvironments or smaller. Last of all, in describing communities, we talk about diversity, and you'll remember this from ecology. Species richness, the number of species, evenness, how individuals are uh, distributed among species in a community, and Richness weighted by evenness is the measure of diversity. In studying communities, the big question is, when you're out in the field making plots and totting up species, how much sampling is enough? How can you know when you've adequately described the community? We use the species area curve for this. It looks something like this. On the x-axis, that might also be the number of samples. But here is something that can answer how big of quadrat size is the right size to use. That gives you the best estimate of species as well. Plant ecologists often use quadrats, four-sided sampling units, usually square-shaped. And these are nested for measuring plants of different sizes. You might sample trees with 10 by 10 meter plots, depending on the kind of tree. Shrubs may be 4 by 4 meter plots, or 2 by 2 meter plots as here. And then smaller and smaller plants can be sampled well, maybe with one by one meter plots or even smaller, depending on plant size and plant height. There's an interesting table in our book that gives examples of some formulas, mathematical formulas,
that have been used to describe species area curves, where s, the number of species, is equal, in Arrhenius's example, to a times x to the b power, where x is area, and a, b, and c, well, a and b are fitted constants. So different plant ecologists have come up with lots of different um, equations they think describe things better. So here in this figure are just three of them, the power function, the logistic function, and exponential function plotted against the natural log of area, because normally, as you know, an exponential curve goes like this, but if you use natural log, it levels these things out. I want you to remember that even though a lot of people talk about species diversity as simply the number of species in an area or in a community, that's only one of the components of diversity, that is species richness. Equitability or species evenness is really important to compare communities, richness weighted by evenness. So richness does not equal diversity because in some cases you can have fewer species present but if their numbers are not even, you can have a more diverse community. Wait a minute, I think if their numbers are really uneven, you have a less diverse community because a measure of diversity is how likely you are to be next to an under, another individual of the same species. And I use this example in ecology class too, but I love it. Here are two communities, A and B. Community A has, they both have four species present, the tulip, the daisy, the bush, and the grass. But community A has three of each, three individuals in each of the species. Community B has one bush, two tulips, a daisy, and a whole bunch of grass. So... I can ask you first the question, which of these communities has greater species richness? And then, which has greater species evenness? And I hope you'll answer for both of those. Community A and B both have equal richness because there are four species present but evenness is community A because there are equal numbers of species or more even numbers of species individuals among the different species. So if diversity is richness weighted by evenness community A will be the more diverse community because it's much less likely that any individual here will end up next to another of its same species. Whereas here, there's an awful lot of grasses next to grasses. So there are lots of different indices for species diversity. Simpson's index, Shannon Wiener, the inverse, Simpson's index. And usually when people are characterizing communities, they figure out several measures of diversity. And these equations or different indices have different merits. If you're looking to account especially for rare species, Pilou's and Shannon Wiener's index are often used. That was only the first part of this table. Here are many others. And in the last part, we see several evenness indexes, indices. The Shannon Evenness Index, Bruyne and Macintosh. So here's a little more complicated example of comparing diversity using different measures, looking at six communities, or, yeah, that's right, six communities here, 
each containing five species. So these five species are present in all of the communities. So here we see species richness is five for all of them. But these different diversity indices have different numbers for each of the communities. And let's look at why that is. The first community has equal numbers of each species. And as we move from the left to the right, the communities have increasingly less equal, less even distribution. So that at this extreme, most of the individuals are of the first species and very few of the other species. So these mostly have the lowest numbers, so diversity is lowest when the disparity, the evenness is lowest. But even though these are different in magnitude, they are similar in the trend that they show from higher to lower here. So what does diversity mean for a community? People have studied this for a long time and there are a number of long-term, large-scale experiments that have shown that increased diversity can also increase the stability of communities if you measure, um, use measures of biomass and productivity. There are others that argue it matters what species are present, what trends that you'll see. So this is a continuing controversy. Several important models of diversity include the broken stick model of MacArthur. The idea is you take a stick and break it up into a bunch of pieces and he hypothesized that therefore the number of rare and common species present in a community was random. But it turns out that very few natural communities are like that. Then there's the geometric model where there are a series of increasingly rare species, starting with common, then pretty common, then less common, et cetera, et cetera, so that most species are uncommon, not very many individuals of these species. And more severe environments show this trend. Sometimes some tropical habitats do too. Then there's the log normal, which many people feel is the best empirical descriptor of communities where there are a few rare species, a few common, and many intermediate in abundance. 20 or 30 years ago, a model was proposed to explain greater diversity um, before the climax is reached in succession. And species diversity is greater with intermediate disturbance than at equilibrium or climax communities because of the continual um, ability of earlier successional species to persist. We're going to talk about succession a little later, but changes over time that happen within a a comprehensible scale to humans from zero to a hundred or five hundred years. This is succession. Changes over time for thousands of years are climatic change and over millions of years we see evolutionary change. You can talk about the stability of a community. A community is resistant if it doesn't change under stress resilient if it recovers from stress, and persistent if it remains unchanged over a long period of time. One way of studying plant communities from the past, vegetation from the past, is to look at pollen that's deposited in the bottom of bodies of water. That's because pollen become microfossils. The exine outer coating of a pollen grain is very resistant and even though the pollen grains die, their coats remain. And these can last for many thousands of years. And by taking core samples, bringing them up, putting these 
samples on slides, palynologists can identify species even, or definitely families and sometimes extinct species and genera from pollen cores. So the abundance of the pollen in the core is related to the abundance of the that plant in the vegetation surrounding the lake, taking into account, of course, pollen ovule ratios, because wind pollinated species are often overrepresented. They have a very high pollen ovule ratio, as you recall from the presentations. So you can construct a profile of pollen and vegetation at different depths, the deeper the sediment, the older the sample. These studies have shown that the predominant species change over time. Sometimes in the past there have been plants of warmer climates replacing those of cooler climates as um, things changed after the last ice age. So there is long-term evidence for a continual warming trend over thousands of years, even though it may have been exacerbated lately by human influence.